on the mountain Over the hills and everywhere Oh, tell it on the mountain That Jesus Christ is born While shepherds kept their watching For silent flocks by The Bible reading for today comes from Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 to 23. Now after they, the wise men, had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated, and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children, she refused to be consoled because they are no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who are seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had, he had, been, what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarean. That's the reading for today. Randy? You know, the first time I remember uh, preaching this text was uh, the Sunday after Christmas Day, first Sunday of Christmas, which is what today is. Uh, 1998. The reason I remember that is because our youngest son, Casey, uh, who will be celebrating his 24th birthday on January 1, uh, was two years old at the time. And I remember I was in my second appointment at Friendship United Methodist Church. It was my, I guess, my uh, second year there as pastor. And I was looking ahead at the electionary readings, and I saw this text, Herod murdering all the two-year-old children and under. And I thought, we still got the Christmas tree lit up in the sanctuary. Why would I preach a text like that with Christmas still very much in our hearts? So I struggled with it. I wrestled with it for quite some time. But for me, uh, when I've had a text that I really didn't want to preach, it 
tends to haunt me. And this one did. It just haunted me. It wouldn't leave me alone. I tried to look at other directions because I, I didn't want to do anything with this text because I don't like this text at all. It's not a happy text. I, I would much prefer the shepherds keeping watch over their flock by night and singing glory to God in the highest and over the priesthood will to men. I titled this sermon this morning, The Other Christmas Story. One of the things that fascinated me about my experience in 1998 of preaching this text was that I, I made a confession at the beginning of the sermon. I, I don't remember much, I really don't remember much of what I said, and I very seldom remember much of anything I ever say when I preach. So if a few days down the road you say, I like your sermon, I'll say, and, so what, and what was it that I said in the sermon? Uh, so if you don't remember my sermon by the time you leave, I'm not offended because I get it. I don't remember it myself. But I do remember a couple of things. I do remember a couple of things that I said. I do remember beginning the sermon, something to the effect of saying, I, I didn't want to preach the sermon, uh, this text. I don't like this text. And I, I remember saying something along the lines of, one of the things this text made me think about was that sometimes Christmas can be the cruelest of holidays. And it was fascinating in that moment, in that setting, it was as if it had been choreographed. I saw people grabbing tissues and beginning to wipe their eyes. And, and so for me, in that sermon in 1998, and I think maybe I felt it so, uh, so powerfully because I had a two-year-old child. Maybe that, that I was, there was a part of the dad in the, in the pastoral sermon but I really wrestled with this idea of how Christmas can be really difficult for so many reasons. And so just really preached a whole sermon around that. I'm not doing that today. I've come to understand the text a little more deeply over the years. But I do want to sort of begin with just that image that's in my own mind because it, it was one of those moments in a preaching moment for this pastor that did seem to live on beyond the moment. Later that week, and I don't generally experience this, but later that week I had people stopping by my office, people calling me on the phone, and they wanted to talk about the sermon. And it wasn't because it was such a great sermon, it was just that it gave some folks license, I think, to acknowledge a pain they had hidden behind the Christmas lights. Because one of the things about Christmas that we all know, there are these Norman Rockwellian Hallmark Channel Christmas images that fill our minds and our hearts that celebrate sort of our perfect families that are somewhat less than perfect, right? And our lives where everything is tied up in a nice, neat bow by the end of the show, and we know life doesn't work that way. We navigate through the imperfections of life. And Christmas, the Christmas holiday, with all of the positive images and with all of the cultural expectations, if you will, that we all should be happy, it can make our unhappiness a little more burdensome. And so for that congregation in that moment, I learned something as a pastor, as a preacher. And so I, I look at Christmas uh, a little differently since, I, since that sermon in 1998. I still love Christmas, and I still find great joy in Christmas, and it is a powerful time for us as the church to celebrate the incarnation, God walking among us in human flesh. But I've also tried to always kind of include in that the recognition that these can be difficult days. And so today maybe you are even feeling that in your own heart, that, you, that you're smiling on the outside, but you got that brokenness on the inside. And so I just want to acknowledge that. I just want to say again that I know these can be hard days, these can be difficult days, and we as the church hopefully can always be that place where we allow us to be real <laughs> and to be authentic. So let me say that at the beginning, because I, I never can bump up against this text without remembering that 1998 moment. And I will again confess to you that I don't like this bit of scripture <laughs> I don't like anything where children, the vulnerable, the weak, especially small children, are abused and are targeted and are murdered. It is a horrific text, this other Christmas story. I've come to understand it, though, theologically a little more deeply than I did in 1998. I, 
I see in this text, again, this painful text, an image of what power looks like when it runs amok. I see in this text what happens when power is used to oppress the vulnerable and the weak. It's clearly in the text. I've seen the tension of that. I've, I've, I've had to reflect over the years on what it means to live in a world where there are the powerful and there are the weak, where there are the oppressors and there are the oppressed. I've had to think through that over the years because I know, here's what I know, here's what history has taught us, that in every human institution, wherever there is power, there is the propensity and may we even say the probability of the abuse of that power. It's true in human governments. It's true in the church. It's true in corporations. On a smaller scale, it's true in workplaces. It's true in families. Wherever there is power, there is the probability that at some point that power will be used in manipulative, coercive, and abusive ways. We are, we're actually kind of looking at the story a little bit backwards. Next week, next Sunday, is Epiphany Sunday. And so we will, next Sunday, look at the text that precedes what Tay read to us this morning, the coming of the wise men. You're more familiar with that story, right? You may remember how when the wise men came, they're following the star, and they go to King Herod, who is front and center in our story today. They go to King Herod, and they say, we are looking for the child born king of the Jews. Now, if you're paying attention, you know that when you go to the palace and ask the king, <laughs> where is the child born king of the Jews, there's going to be a problem. And so Herod clearly sees Jesus as a political threat to his kingship. And history has told us something about Herod, that he was so paranoid, so maniacal, that, that any threat to his throne, uh, he would try to vanquish any way that he could. History even tells us that he had his wife put to death and one of his sons put to death because he saw them as threats to the throne. So it's no surprise that he would strike out and try his best to destroy the baby Jesus, the child born king of the Jews. And he's so infuriated when the wise men don't come back and tell him where they found the baby that he says, we'll just wipe out all of the children. Now, there's a part of me, well, there's a real part of me that wants to hope that that really didn't happen. Matthew's the only one that tells us this story, and, and historians beyond the Bible don't speak to this. So I want to say that maybe it didn't actually happen. It was Matthew making a theological point. I can't make that claim one way or the other. You're, as my old professor Mickey Eford would say, you can pay your money, you can take your choice on that. One of the things that's really clear in this text, in this horrific story, however, is that Matthew wants to make a, a connection in the way he tells this story. Again, it's unique to Matthew. Matthew wants to make a connection between Jesus and Moses. And if you remember the story of Moses, in Moses' birth, do you remember back in the Old Testament story in the book of Exodus, Pharaoh, in that story, uh, wanted for all the Hebrew boys when they were born to be killed, right? And then you remember the midwives who were not doing that, the Jewish midwives uh, who were there. And so Herod finally said, uh, told everybody that if you find an infant boy of the Hebrews, you throw him in the Nile. And remember the story of Moses, that his mother hid him for, I think, about three months, and then she put him in the little basket, and then Pharaoh's daughter found her, and he ended up being raised in Pharaoh's home, if you remember that. Well, so theologians say that one thing that Matthew is doing in telling this story is to make a connection between Jesus and Moses, because for Matthew, Jesus is the new lawgiver. He is the new Moses. We'll see that later in the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus, like Moses, when he gave the law on Mount Sinai, Jesus will give the Sermon on the Mount. And there are a lot of parallels that, Jesus, that, uh, that Matthew does want to draw between Jesus and Moses. So maybe one reason why we have this horrific story of this tyrant trying to kill Jesus is because it does echo back to a tyrant trying to kill Moses. One of the things I can't get away from in this text is my own recognition as a Christian 
what it means for me in a world filled with, with power, what it means for me for a world filled with uh, vulnerable individuals and groups of people who are exposed to the improper uses of power, what does that mean for me to be a cruciform, cross-carrying follower of Jesus? I do believe, I do believe that the day will come. I do believe that when Christ comes in final victory, I do believe that he will want to know where we have stood. Have we stood on the side of the power against the weak? Have we stood on the side of the oppressor over against the oppressed? Or have we stood and taken up the cause of the weak and the vulnerable and the outcast and the ostracized? Have we been numbered among the strong or the weak? I believe that's a question that we will want to be confronted with or we will be confronted with whether we want to be or not when the day comes. So I can't get away from this text without thinking about this power and powerless imagery that we have. There are other elements to this story that connect with the Old Testament. You heard them in what Tay was reading to us this morning, Rachel crying out, lamenting over the death of these children. Remember Rachel? Rachel was the wife, one of the two wives of Jacob. He married sisters, Rachel and Leah. If you remember that story, Rachel had two children herself, Joseph and Benjamin. She died in childbirth, giving birth to Benjamin on the way to Bethlehem. And so she becomes then for the people the cry on behalf of children. There are other things in this story, too, that are interesting that you could draw parallels between, again, Matthew's story of the birth of Jesus and the events following and the Old Testament. Joseph, if you remember the story of Joseph, the firstborn of Rachel, he was the dreamer. He's the one that kept having all of these dreams about what would happen. In the story of the birth of Jesus, Joseph, the husband of Mary, is visited by angels. Four different times he's visited by angels in dreams. There are these connections that, that continue to be drawn out. Did you hear Tay when he was reading about uh, the flight to Egypt, uh, Joseph and Mary and the babe, when uh, they got wind of the uh, attempted attack or the attack that Herod was going to make on the family trying to destroy the baby. They went to Egypt. Do you remember where Egypt is in the story of uh, Israel? They were in Egyptian bondage. What was a place of bondage there now is a place of refuge. And also the text that Tay referenced, out of Egypt I have called my son, from Hosea referring to Israel being called out. And now Matthew creates this narrative that connects Jesus again with the story of Moses and the people of Israel. It is really interesting when you lay the two stories beside how Matthew really wants to help his Jewish Christian audience understand that Jesus really is the new Moses, the new lawgiver. I want to I want to just reflect a little bit on this on this notion of God at work in the midst of human cruelty. God at work in the midst of bad news. God at work when the good news that he brings is not evident to all. The, part of the good news of this text is, as painful as it is for us, is that God's will will not be thwarted. God's purposes will ultimately be fulfilled. I like what Sally Purvis, theologian Sally Purvis says when she was reflecting on the crucifixion of Jesus. She said, violence did its worst and love and life went on. The good news of this text, I think, as painful as it is, is that the darkness will do everything it can to vanquish the light, but the light remains. You know, Tyrants will come and go. It's throughout human history. Oppressive regimes will come and go. It's part of human history. Herod, who sought to destroy the child and did kill others, according to Matthew's narrative anyway, eventually died himself. The Roman Empire that eventually put Jesus on the cross would eventually fall into the dustbin of history. Oppressive power expressions will come and 
they will go. We learn something in the story of Jesus, though. We learn something about eternal power, real power, that will stand against the temporal power structures of the world, the real power of love and light and grace and justice in the face of the world's darkness. This text is not the kind of text that we hear and that we feel good about and that we leave with a joyful heart. This text is hard. It's a text that only comes around every three years, and thanks be to God for that. (laughs) But it does have a word for us, I think, that we would do well to hear. And again, I think part of that word is, where do we stand when all is said and done? Do we stand where it seems the Old Testament prophets are pretty clear and where the Gospel of Luke especially is pretty clear and and many good theologians are pretty clear that God stands on the side of the weak, the vulnerable, the oppressed, the children. And so at the end of the day, where will we be found standing? On the side of the oppressor or on the side of the oppressed? I believe that's a question for each of us as Christians. It's a question for us as the church. And also, it's an important point for us to be mindful of in these days when our beautiful decorations still adorn our sanctuaries and our places of worship. Because the world is filled with darkness and the world is filled with bad news. You know, at our Christmas Eve service, if you were with us, you know, we lit candles. We took the light from the Christ candle symbolically, and we shared the light throughout the room. And we wondered, perhaps, what it looked like for us all to share the measure of light we've been given in the world. And maybe that's a good image to hold in our heart even as we leave today. On this first Sunday after Christmas, even with the reality of the principalities and the evil powers of this world that still push against the light, that still oppress the weak. Maybe through the grace and goodness of God, we may become vehicles more fully of this light that we might stand with those who need an advocate, that we might stand with those who need a friend, a co-laborer. And so may the world look upon us. May the world find in us, especially the weak and the vulnerable and the outcast and the disenfranchised, may the world see in us that friend. May the world see in us the church, the body of Christ at work in the world. And may we hold the measure of light in our heart that we've been given. And may we be vehicles of God's good news in the face of the bad news that is so easy to find still in the world today. And yeah, maybe you've brought into this place today your own hurts as well, your own darkness, your own struggles, your own doubts, your own heaviness with the imperfections of life. May the church be for you that place where we can be honest about our hurts, honest about our struggles, And know that we are a part of a redemptive community, a community committed to justice and mercy and compassion for all people created in the image of God for whom Christ died. May God enable us so to live and bear witness to one another to that good news so that when we depart our gathered time of worship, we may be for the world what Jesus said we were in the Sermon on the Mount the light of the world. May God so enable us to live throughout our lives, throughout our days. To God be the glory. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I heard an old story How Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood atoning And I repented of my sin And won the victory Oh, victory.